Recall then that free fatty acids are not going to exist alone for particularly long periods of time within a, a cellular system. They're, they act like detergents, they're not particularly good for the cell. So in fact the storage form of fats and as well as the dietary form of fats are triacylglycerols. So we recognize that those are the esterified form in which we're going to see fatty acids being um, stored. That is to say that the long um, fatty acyl side chains are linked via an ester bond to a glycerol backbone. And this is the common form in which our, our body, for example, within our adipocytes, that's how we're going to store fats. It's also the way in which you're going to take in fats in your diet. And as we mentioned, fats are packed with power. And some of you are already flexing your sexy OCHEM minds are like, I'm looking at these long hydrocarbon side chains and saying to myself, man, those are wicked packed with power. Think about how much energy could be gleaned by ripping and stripping the high energy electrons off of those carbon, 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 hydrogen bonds. Said another way, think about the power or energy that would be released when the hydrocarbon side chains of a fat are oxidized in the fossil fuel industry. That's why we like to tap into resources that provide hydrocarbons. But it's also why our body can glean a lot of energy from these very highly reduced bonds. And what your body does with them is to rip and strip high energy electrons from them, take those electrons to the ETC on those electron carrying molecules, use those electrons to then um, form a proton motive force. That proton motive force is a pent up battery like power that can be tapped into to make our favorite ATP molecule. So we recognize the packed power in a triacylglycerol. However, I want to draw our attention to something else about a triacylglycerol. In the form that we have cur currently drawn right here, um, it is a sterically non-committed molecule, um, right? No, reminds us of people we know, sterically uncommitted, all the best people, right? And so we recognize that um, in its current form, perhaps we can't really distinguish between the fatty acyl side chains, and we're not necessarily showing a lot of chirality to that number two labeled carbon. Carbon. So you might even ask yourself, how is it that Rachel's labeling that carbon number two, when in fact you're not able to distinguish. However, if we do look at this with maybe a, just a little bit of a second view, recognizing that perhaps the hydrocarbon side chain on of labeled R1 here is different from that labeled R3, we can start to get a view of something that does have a central chiral carbon. If we were to just take that molecule then and just sort of flip it on its side so that we could begin to look at stereochemistry, we'll draw carbon 2 here as sort of the central point and put that label, this is carbon 2. Let's then draw the bonds that are coming out of the page at you. So kind of fill that in. And then, of course, the bonds that are going into the page and away from you. And recognize then that this is the hydrogen atom bound to that carbon two. And then of course it has its ester linkage. And we'll call this the R2 group bound to, of course, carbon one here and drawing the ester linkage from this. And recognizing that this R1, if that structure is different at that R1, then this is what contributes to the chirality of that central carbon. And now we can finally add on, make sure we get our full formula there. We can now add on the third carbon, carbon 3, and show its ester linkage as well and R3, and recognize now 
the stereochemistry of what was a stereochemically non-committed structure over here, we've now drawn in the stereochemistry enabling us to see and recognize the ability for carbon number two to be a central chiral carbon if uh, the R1 and R3 groups differ from the R2, then of course that central carbon is in fact bound to four different constituent groups. With our societal aversion to fats and our desire to try to have something that tastes like fat but isn't fat and that won't contribute to caloric intake for our bodies, um, there was a craze in the 80s and 90s to develop a fatty tasting potato chip that didn't have any absorbable fat. And, and onto the scene came Olestra. And this is a picture of Olestra. It's fascinating to look at the structural differences between Olestra and a triacylglycerol. Notice that in Olestra, instead of having a glycerol backbone, it actually has a disaccharide backbone. This disaccharide you might recognize as Sucrose. Sucrose is then esterified to count them eight fatty acyl side chains. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is a lot of fat and a lot of slippery fatty tasting food. But guess what? We cannot break down this epically large molecule. So Alestra slips right through our GIT and along with it goes all of our fat soluble vitamins, D, A, and K, for example. So so Alestra was brought into question because, of course, it was contributing to uh, malnutrition, and uh, we were seeing some sort of dubious side effects of Alestra, such as uh, anal leakage and very slippery, oily diarrhea. So uh, Alestra fell out of favor, and even Lay's light potato chips were taken off of the market in 2013. There's a lot of uh, very angry customers that you can find online if you're up for a good laugh. <laughs>